As you should recall, last time we talked about the Depression, the WPA, the end of World War I. Well, this time we're going to go into World War II, which is another event that dramatically changed the direction of golf course design and the number of golf course constructions. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they totally changed the face of the world in a lot of ways, bringing the United States into war in Europe, a war that devastated many golf courses in Europe and also brought the U.S. into the Industrial Revolution or out of the Industrial Revolution or into a force to be reckoned with in the world. And particularly after the war, there was a void of golf course architects. And one architect, particularly Robert Trent Jones Sr., is going to step in and epitomize the John Wayne, we're Americans, we just won the war, we're bigger, we're stronger, we're better than everybody, and we're going to build golf courses to reflect that. So that's a point in history that the pendulum has swung away from, but at the time... In the 50s and 60s, the U.S. was pretty full of itself, and Robert Trent Jones epitomized that. World War II was devastating to the world. Uh, many, many people died. Um, if you watch some of the Band of Brothers movies or Pearl Harbor, you can just see the, the incredible devastation. We talk about wars we're in now, where casualties here are just you know, fractions of the percentage of people that were killed in the war in Europe. There are great advances from this war. We go from propeller-driven airplanes to jet airplanes. Uh, machines, one of the reasons the U.S. won the war is attributed to the ingenuity of the American spirit and being able to fix tanks faster than the Germans. The Germans supposedly had much better tanks than us, but they couldn't fix them. The tight Mercedes engines couldn't be put together where the Americans could take 10 broken tanks and make eight tanks out of them. So they were quickly able to put our tanks back into action. And this is uh, part, of, part of what won the war for us in, in Europe anyway. The war caused petroleum shortages. They caused man shortages. There were very few men of fighting age around, so golf wasn't an issue, and ma golf maintenance wasn't an issue. A lot of people that normally would be working on a golf course, all the people your age, uh, or the age of most people in the, the class, would have been sent to the war. But on May 8th, 1945, uh, Victory in Europe Day. Um, courses needed reconstruction, a lot of people were going to be sent home, this was a very jubilant time, and, the, and these pictures reflect the elation that was felt by the American people uh, being able to not have to fight in Europe. There was still a rough battle to be fought um, against the Japanese. The Japanese were not going to lay down their swords. The kamikaze pilots happened at this time, and the atom bomb also adds to that invincibility of the United States and this we're bigger than you, we're, we're better than you, we can, uh, we can rule the world and we, we did for or have uh, since. Um, by this time Ross is dead, um, Allison, Maxwell, all of the or most of the golden age architects are done. Even Stanley Thomas um, dies in 1952 which allows Robert Trent Jones to take over his practice. Robert Trent Jones creates a job for he creates a curriculum at Cornell University. He studies landscape architecture, so he learns to draw. He studies surveying, so the, the trades of Seth Rayner. He studies hydraulics in, in water. Um, he studies horticulture in, in turf and agronomy. So Cornell's a land grant university and he's allowed to do that. And he studies turf grass. So he doesn't just jump in there think, thinking he knows everything. 
He also studies philosophy. He studies the Greeks and the Romans. He's a very smart man, and, and this is, helps him, even if it doesn't help him design better golf courses, it helps him get jobs. And, and he's very smart in promoting himself. He studies history um, in the classics. So a unique curriculum that has been basically recreated by Tom Doak and has served, served RTJ well, and has also served uh, Tom Doak well as an author and golf course architect. In the 50s and 60s, turf management takes off. The GCSAA is formed. Uh, gang mowers come out. Here's a picture of an early Pinehurst gang mower. Hybrid Bermuda grass comes into play. So some of the first hybrids, a lot of the early weed scientists um, were hired by the government and did research. Um, some of the first grass research was done during World War II to come up with grasses that would be better for runways for airplanes to land on. Even one of my professors at Rutgers um, was a weed scientist. They came up with a chemical that they could spray on wheat and the wheat would grow and look normal and then when they ran a combine through it there would be no wheat at all. So a brutal agricultural way of fighting the war and they were planning on spraying this on crops in Europe but it never happened. The other thing that happened with this industrial revolution was in, in also the munition factories um, nitrogen is a, a big factor in making bombs and the technology to build bombs was pushed so far forward that fertilizer became an easily obtainable thing for the first time. We didn't have to go up into the mountains like Donald Ross did and dig bat guano out of a cave, we could have a fertilizer plant that could use natural gas and petroleum to make fertilizer. Some of the first research is done on weeds at Michigan State University. Uh, Dr. Beal, a study that's still going on to this day, planted packets of weed seed. The One of the few weeds that germinates every time, even it's been almost uh, 70, 80 years now, Crabgrass seed will germinate, so they studied that. Um, Dr. Kunze, my advisor from Michigan State, came up with the USGA green at this time, so the, the perched water table and using a sand-based green to get non-compactable soils, allowing more people to play golf. And again, the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. So this is an important slide, and you should know these things for the next exam and for the final exam, because it, Everybody in here studying to be a turf manager. Here's an early picture of them installing the hybrid Bermuda grass out behind Pinehurst. So, um, looking almost like a plantation workforce, but they were uh, going at it on their hands and knees, just like Donald Ross did in uh, in Dornock. So the next section we're going to talk about Robert Trent Jones and how he really changes golf course design. In 1930 he was able to use the WPA workers to lay out some courses in upstate New York, um, managed a few jobs during the war but mostly uh, made contacts that would serve him well. So he did not go to the war, he traveled, he stayed here so he was able to rub elbows with some of the rich golfing people around and when when the economy changed, when we had this boom of the servicemen coming back and starting families and golfing, he was uniquely positioned to do that. And he got a huge break in 1941 because Augusta had been taken out of play. He was asked to redo Augusta National and he got a lot of national press from this. He redid the 8th, 11th, 12th, 13th and 16th green. 16 probably being one of the biggest changes. Um, he turned around 11 completely, uh, taking a dog leg right and making it a long, straight par 4. He was the first to dam Ray's Creek. So he took this hazard, this crooked hazard, and expanded it, made it a, a great big lake. Um, Radiant 16, and 16 is probably the most famous. He dammed Ray's Creek and put that big pond in front, and then uh, Dwight Eisenhower 
at, came and rehabilitated, recuperated himself from his war efforts. And while he was there, he painted the 16th hole, and this got into the national press as well. So this really helped Robert Trent Jones uh, take off, particularly after Eisenhower became president. So the president had drawn a picture of his work. So there's the 16th at Augusta, so we have this little creek, and then what uh, Ross Dam or RTJ dams it up in 16. And 16 is probably one of those influential holes. This is where a lot of things change on Sunday at Augusta, and the, the creek adds to, I guess, the ambiance of that. So going from a stream that was a smaller hazard to an ominous pond is something that uh, Robert Trent Jones did at Augusta. So his next big project and famous project is Peachtree. So Peachtree ushers in this modern golf course architecture, the John Wayne, massive greens, massively long tees, affording many different tee positions, almost like runways, um, a uniquely American man-sized golf course. So Peachtree is very different. Peachtree was built by Bobby Jones, in Atlanta to be his private club. So very exclusive, uh, elephant-mounded, buried greens. And also at this time, he designed the outside nine at Country Club of North Carolina. So um, nine holes that don't exist anymore because they were redone um, in the recent region. But it used to be very, stick out like a sore thumb, you would play four hole or three holes of Willard Bird, and then nine holes of Robert Trent Jones, uh, heroic style golf, and then come back to four uh, resort type golf holes. So that was, was redone recently, and I, I thought that that was probably a bad decision on uh, Arthur Hills doing that. They probably should have hired Roger Rurich, who had worked his entire career with Robert Trent Jones. Long tees, huge greens. Uh, the tenth is called the Elephant Burial Ground. Uh, many pin placements on each green and allowing more play, more changeability or flexibility in the manner of setting up the golf course. And this becomes kind of the modern way. And he redoes a lot of golf courses to make them more difficult, longer, yet uh, more playable from a superintendent standpoint where you can have more play on the golf course. And here is before it was redone that ninth at Cardinal. So a really tucked in Robert Trent Jones style golf course. And then the 13th again, heroic shots damming up the creek and having these shots over the creek. In 1949, he gets to redo Donald Ross's Oakland Hills and changes every hole, uh, pinches in the fairways, rebunkers it, and uh, Hogan plays this tournament and calls it the monster. So he gets all kinds of press. Um, only two people break the 70 par, and um, he gets a great big article in the, the New Yorker. So this pushes his franchise even further. And we'll stop there for the first part. We'll come back and learn a little more about heroic design and also uh, Desmond Muirhead in the second part of our lectures for this unit.